Hello everyone, it is lovely to see you all again. In fact, I'm going to scroll through my screens now so I can see all the people that have their video on. Hello. Um, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, hello. We are talking maths in public, so we're talking maths in lockdown at the moment. Um, and there's four of us on the committee who have decided to put on these sessions so that you can have a little bit more um, chance to talk to other maths communicators and other STEM communicators with an interest in maths um, and a couple of extra people as well, I'm sure, who are interested in you know, chatting about... You know, you oh, someone's on the phone and they're not muted. Um, the Do you know what? I think that might be my other half in the background. Uh -huh. Do you want to mute, mute yourself? Yeah, let me. Yeah, cool. Um, so, where was I? Yes, we're doing these sessions so you have a chance to um, share things that, that you're coming up against and learn new things and, and just have the support of the other people around you a little bit. Um, Many of us at the moment, we're doing things online that we'd normally do face to face. So today's session, we've invited three guest speakers who are doing things online, just like you are, but have a bit of experience that they'd like to share with us and things that they've learned, um, possibly since the lockdown, possibly things they've been doing for years. There's a bit of a balance there. So they're sharing what their experience is to help you with the things that you're doing. Um, Following that, we'll have a question and answer session, and then we'll have some other tips and tricks. And if there's time at the end, we'll have some more discussion time and things like that. Uh, we are recording the session. So we're recording primarily the guest speakers and the question and answer session. But in order to do that, we are recording at the moment as well. Um, if there is anything you want to ask during the question and answer and you don't want to be on the screen or you don't want your voice recorded that's absolutely fine send us a message stick it in the chat for everyone to see or ben will be chairing the q a session so you can send him a message privately to with your question in and we'll we'll get that asked for you um, one thing i will add is to please remember that we have a code of conduct for all of our team up activities, including these Talking Maths in Lockdown sessions. Um, if you haven't read that, please, please do so. Generally, be welcoming, be polite. Remember that everyone's sort of dealing with a lot of things at the moment. So, so be kind, be considerate and respectful and try and use gender neutral language as much as you possibly can. Um, and just a reminder that people are sharing things here that they are sharing with the community that, that's on this call. It's not for stuff for you to sort of then share afterwards um, if you wanted to share anything that anyone sort of put forward ask them about it and ask them if that's that's okay and you don't need to do any sort of kind of recording or trying to um, keep a record of what the people are speaking are saying because we will record it and we aim to put that up within about a week so that's enough of me talking if you have any questions do let us know um, and I'm going to hand over to Kevin, who's going to introduce our speakers today. Right, nearly forgot to unmute myself there. Um, well, hello, I did everybody. I forget to introduce us, ourselves, so I'll introduce myself and then <laughs> introduce the others. So, hello, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Sam Durbin. So one of the things that I do in my spare time is organising Talking Maths in Public, which is a biennial conference for maths communicators. Um, I'm also currently on furlough from the Royal Institution where I look after our secondary maths masterclass programme. Um, we also have Katie. Hello. Do you want me to introduce myself? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Katie. I do maths outreach in uh, as many possible different forms as I can get away with. and. Uh, if you don't already know who I am, I'm quite easy to Google, so you can find out what I do there. But I do uh, teach part time at university now and I do lots of uh, workshops and talks and various things and bits of writing and math stuff. And Ben. Hey, my name is Ben Sparks. I work uh, for the AMSP for half my time and half my time freelance doing maths outreach teacher training. I was a maths teacher for 10 years and I also am one fourth of the TMIP community. Occasionally I get to do some maths outreach online in number file videos and things like that. Um, and I've been playing more than is healthy with ways of communicating online ever since we had to do that, which is why today's hopefully interesting for all of us also doing that. And then Kevin can introduce himself and then the speakers. <laughs> right. Hello. Yes. Um, 
I'm Kevin Houston. I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds. I'm also a I'm also the Education Secretary of the London Mathematical Society, and I've been involved in outreach for many many years. Um, and also, I'm very easy to find online, so you can just Google my name uh, if you want to know more about me. So we might as well just uh, get on with the uh, today's fantastic lineup. So uh, first up, we've got Dr. Jamie Gallagher, who uh, he got his PhD in chemistry and electrical engineering and has spent over a decade in public engagement and science communication. Okay, so he's, he's, he's won various awards, including the Scottish Fame Lab final. So great one, great one to have there. Um, since 2017, he's been freelance. He runs training workshops and acts as a consultant. And uh, during lockdown, he's, he's still running these uh, workshops and consultancies and consultancy as normal um, and he also runs virtually social which is um, I'll, I'll quote from the uh, the website is a uh, a weekly online discussion for people interested in public engagement and science communication um, which i think is a brilliant idea and i think that's why we kind of nicked it for this so uh, i'll hand over to jamie who will uh, uh, dis discuss things like zoom i think is, is what he's going to be talking about okay yeah take it away Brilliant. Thanks, Kevin. Um, hello, everyone. I am Jamie Gallagher, and uh, Kevin's introduced me pretty well, uh, but I kind of categorize myself into doing three main things. Uh, the first thing is that I am a science communicator, so often found uh, on stage, TV, radio, or, or writing, uh, a whole mix of different things. Uh, second part is that I'm a trainer, so I work normally with universities looking at public engagement or particularly evaluation, uh, and I'm also a consultant as well, so working on lots of ref impact case studies uh, at the minute that's uh, a system of grading universities and uh, at the start of lockdown I found my freelance career uh, ended I thought uh, with no possibility of delivering uh, online training uh, no possibility of in-person events or training SciComm felt dead training felt dead um, and even consultancy was quieting down and I was pretty worried so I first of all I thought well I need to keep myself busy. Like the type of person I am, I need to work constantly or I am not a happy person. So I needed projects to start looking into. Uh, and that's why I started Virtually Social, uh, was a way of me feeling more connected to the community uh, during lockdown and also just something that I could channel my energies into. And I thought, well, I would set up a, a space where uh, science communicators and public engagement professionals could come together, uh, carry on discussions, and just so that we were aware that we're all still here and we're all still working. There was one big problem to that. Uh, my online experience was pretty much nil. Uh, aside from a misspent youth as a gamer, like I lived on TeamSpeak and Medal of Honor and Command and Conquer. That was my whole teenage years and into my 20s. Uh, but that felt in the past. Like I was no gamer or streamer uh, anymore. So I set about creating online events, online training with just my laptop and my camera. And I started organizing events, but every single week I was learning something about the events. And every time that people came back, hopefully they noticed a little bit of an increase in quality. Because in between times I was reading a lot, I was going on YouTube a lot to find out what I could do to improve the, the quality of my events. And the angle I wanted to give to you today is one of the amateur. Uh, what was it, like five weeks ago, seven weeks ago, I didn't know what Zoom was and I was using just my laptop. I've now kind of twisted and changed things to be using quite a different system. If I flick over cameras now, you can see I'm standing up, I'm using this microphone. I'm gonna turn it so you can see my camera. as well. So you can see that I'm talking to uh, a DSLR camera now instead of uh, uh, my laptop camera because it looks a little bit better. So I thought I would just take you through from a kind of amateur perspective what I did to create a different setup to help kind of increase the professionalism of the training that I was offering uh, online. The first barrier, I thought, well, I, I needed a better camera. That was my first thing. I was like, I need a better camera. What can I do? And so I started looking for webcams, impossible to find. Uh, what was possible to find was DSLR cameras. So I thought, well, I could buy that one. But if I want to plug in a DSLR like I've got, then normally you need an HDMI capture card. Laptops don't really like taking in an HDMI feed. Uh, and the capture cards were 
again, impossible to find. So I managed to get hold of a, a Canon M50, which actually plugs into my laptop via USB. So the camera I'm speaking to is a digital camera that is just plugged in through USB. Brilliant, except the platforms that take in uh, USB feeds from cameras don't like to take in USB feeds from cameras. Uh, so Zoom would not recognize the Canon M50. So that meant I had to get the, the hardware into my laptop, then into another program that could then go into Zoom, which was my chosen platform. So this is my kind of home turf is, is Zoom. A few things I did uh, to start that, um, I'm just gonna come down here. Hopefully this will work. Uh, if I start off here, oh no, you're getting infinite me. That wasn't part of the plan. This might help. That's what we're here for, frankly. <laughs> Yeah, infinite me. Anyway, I'll just talk you through it. Uh, so I started off, I got my camera, I got my microphone. They both go into my laptop uh, and they go into a program called Ecamm Live. Uh, some of you might have heard of OBS, which is a, a kind of broadcasting platform. Ecamm Live is like OBS, but for Macs. Uh, so it's geared up a little bit more for, for Macs and it can take a USB feed from my camera and it's using my USB podcasting mic. So that's pulling them both in. That then wants to go into Zoom. But here there's another problem. Uh, if you're using a Mac, Zoom has now blocked virtual cams. So uh, the, the uh, camera that I'm using up here is blocked by Zoom and also the camera down there, uh, which is my phone that's connected using Epoch Cam is also blocked. Uh, there are workarounds for this. You can use an older version of Zoom, but they're stopping using that. Uh, I'm currently using an unsigned version of Zoom, uh, which you can discover how to do that in Reddit forums, uh, if, uh, forums if you want. But what I was basically looking for was a way of getting a decent camera into Zoom. Uh, and so that's the main thing that I use is Ecamm Live. If you're using Windows, it's probably easier and certainly cheaper to use OBS. And these are just programs that will capture in your content and then push out whatever you need to show. The other advantage of using a, a kind of third party program like that is that you're going to be able to put in cut scenes and things like that seamlessly without uh, doing screen share. So normally in Zoom, you'd have to share a screen, but I can just push a button and play a video, which is a little bit smoother than doing the screen share on, on Zoom. The other bit that I have uh, of kit is uh, what I just pushed the button on. Uh, so I've also got a, a stream deck and this allows me to uh, put in some commands into the computer without me using the, the mouse or clicking through. So I mentioned that I'm broadcasting on Zoom, but I'm running my camera and my sound through Ecamm Live. Uh, and this little deck here allows me to control Ecamm Live while I'm still uh, focusing on the Zoom call. No, that's a lot of names and things to, to throw at you. Uh, the, the, the folk have already prepared a document that takes you through some of these programs so you can see and go through them at your leisure. Uh, it has taken me a long time to work out how to put them all together, but uh, YouTube is invaluable. There's so many bits of kit uh, that uh, is explained on YouTube. And what I'd recommend for anyone that's looking to upscale the quality of what they're broadcasting is raid right around their house. What do you have? Your phone camera is gonna be better than your uh, laptop camera. If you've got an external mic, so this is a, a podcasting mic, but it just works as a USB mic and hopefully is giving me a better quality than uh, my laptop would. Uh, so maybe you could use that. If nothing else, think about using headphones, various bits and pieces. A lot can be cobbled together uh, and dumped into OBS or Ecamm to give quite a smooth output on Zoom. Uh, I'll, I'll finish off just with a, a couple more points on Zoom because that's what I use. I'm running all my training through there. I'm trying to make it as interactive as possible. So I use a lot of polls, a lot of breakout rooms um, and third party programs that I send people to. Time and time again, I get people telling me about the security issues in Zoom, the security issues in Zoom. My kind of question is what security issues on Zoom? Things have been tightened up and I don't see that Zoom is any better or worse than any of the other platforms you're really using. So for me, Zoom is incredibly easy for people to access and there are sufficient controls to ensure that your meeting is safe and controlled. Uh, now there was an issue a month ago where Zoom bombing effectively people could cold call into your, your meeting 
that's no longer an issue. Not with the, the longer uh, hyperlinks to join a meeting, the default meeting passwords, and the added security program that they've added down the bottom. So if you're a little bit worried uh, about using Zoom, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I don't think that it is any more dangerous than any of the other online platforms. And for me, running training, if someone really is going to gate crash and listen to me talking about public engagement for three hours, they're kind of welcome to. So if you've got any questions about what I'm doing uh, as having gone from uh, nothing to I think a relatively professional setup in a few weeks, uh, then just give me a shout, type some questions in the, the comments, or when we come to the, the discussion, shout out any questions, and I'll be happy to answer from the total noob perspective. This is not beyond anyone, because I'm not very good with tech. I just upscaled every week a little extra thing was added in. And so that's my perspective from running online events. Okay. Well Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, okay, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to do the question and answers um, later on. Um, and, uh, but I think maybe first, um, we, we didn't organize how we were going to do uh, thanking our speakers. And so some people are giving reactions. I don't know if you noticed down the bottom, there's a reactions little emoji type thing. You can press and you can get thumbs up and claps for the, for the speaker. So it, it saves us all turning on our mics and going, hey. so, um, you know, Please do that, and the, the speaker can see how um, see how we're doing or how they did. Right. Okay. So before you go on, Kevin, just like to say that if anyone does have questions, particularly for Jamie, and you want to get them in the chat now, you are welcome to, and I will try and pick them up later on, or jot, jot them down and talk to us later. Right. Indeed. Good. Right. Okay. So moving on now to our second speaker, uh, it's uh, Trent Burton. Um, so, uh, well, I hope you all know about the, the Cosmic Shambles Network, um, book Shambles with Robin Ince and Josie Long. So there's also Science Shambles and various other things with uh, Brian Cox. Uh, he's also produced videos for Matt Parker. Um, but I think um, one of the main things he's got at the moment is, is the uh, Cosmic Shambles that he's, uh, network that he's created with, with Robin Ince. So he's got lots of experience working with live events and record, recording of our online media. Uh, in particular, he's run a series of online science events over the last few weeks. Uh, so he knows all about the technical problems producing, producing such things. Um, so uh, if you'd like to take that away, take it away, please, Trent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm director of a company called Trunkman Productions, and we produce the Cosmic Shambles Network, which is basically podcasts and documentaries and live shows based around science and maths and music and comedy. Uh, if you've ever been to Nine Less Than Carol's or Robin and Brian's Compendium of Reason at Hammersmith Apollo, that is us. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, since we've been doing those live for about a decade, uh, obviously we're not doing them now. So we tried to work out a way that we could do that kind of variety show online um, without being able to get to the studio or onto a stage. So about eight weeks ago, Melinda, who is uh, another producer at Cosmic Shambles, Robin, uh, Josie and me come up with the idea to try and do a live stream morning show and an evening show every day for the two weeks that lockdown was going to last. Uh, we've now done about a hundred and something of them. Uh, live every day. They go out on our Cosmic Shambles YouTube channel and on the Cosmic Shambles website and sometimes on Twitch as well for some of the shows. Our basic aim for them was threefold. We wanted to do something that was entertaining and informative and try and create a sense of community that we couldn't get from doing the live shows anymore. Uh, we wanted to raise some money for artists and venues uh, that aren't getting any income or lots of venues in our closing that we used to do shows in and talks in. So we've raised about 20,000 pounds that we've sent out so far to venues and performers. Uh, and also we wanted to do it as quick as possible, which was possibly foolhardy. Uh, so from the day that we decided that we were going to do this, we were up and live with a live show within just under three days, basically in mid March. Um, we told everyone it was going to be a bit of a technical nightmare to begin with. We did our sound check and our tech check and our first run live with an audience of a couple of thousand people. And it went very poorly from a technical point of view, but that was the point we wanted to know what was going to go wrong. We just wanted to be up essentially. 
so that means that we've we've kind of been learning this whole thing on the fly from my home studio and kind of embraced the the chaos that that was going to to bring in uh we got the best suggestion we got when we went live was someone asked would it be possible to do the whole thing in vr because then it would feel more like being at a gig they asked this on day four we're not in vr as yet um so i thought what might be useful is uh i'll talk quickly about the three main helpful uh helpful questions and suggestions we get asked in the live chat about why we're doing things the way that we're doing them and then I'll be around for the Q&A after as well. The first question that we get a hundred times every day is why don't we use Zoom? Because we use Skype as the way to start the group chat, not Zoom. There's a lot of reasons. Mostly it's because the back end. We, I'm never or very, very rarely am I on uh, the show. I'm just running the back end from our studio here. Skype works much better with, uh, we don't use OBS, but if you want to use OBS, because it's, it's free, Skype plays with OBS a lot nicer on PC and Mac. You can do a lot more with virtual cameras. You can treat the calls as cameras. Makes it, it just makes it easier to do a show rather than what Zoom is, which is essentially a very good video conferencing platform, but it's not great for making a show. And our, our aim was always to make a show where we could cut to different guests, make people full screen, move, do lots of inserted stuff, bring in lots of graphics and all sorts of stuff and basically run it like we're doing a live, um, a live morning show or a live talk show. And Skype is a lot more flexible for that. There's a lot more stuff in the back end that you can muck around with. It's a lot more stable, uh, that sort of stuff than Zoom is, we've found. And we've got our own kind of custom back end that we run everything through. So people will call up Skype, they will be on, as far as they're aware, they're just on a Skype call. And then that runs everything into a, a custom vision mixer that we've got running here. So we can mix the show like it's a sports broadcast, essentially. And that enables people to be able to do it if they wanna use cam link or something like what Jamie's got set up, they can do it with DSLRs or they can just use their webcam. It doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm just seeing a camera and they're on a normal Skype call. So they, the presenters then don't have to worry about anything technical. They're just doing their talk or being in a conversation or doing a song or doing a stand up set or whatever they're doing. All they've got to be is connected to Skype and everything else we take care of in the back end that also means we can use Skype or uh, similar to what was done for the Watson 24 hour show uh, last weekend that uh, the guys from Wi-Fi Wars set up a lot of that back end. We basically can have a green room. So rather than anyone just being like in Zoom, everyone's on, we've got an off broadcast green room that people sign into, they're in there, they're waiting, they're not necessarily on air yet, they're just waiting to go on. And also I can act like a floor manager that way that I've got a microphone talking to Robin and Josie saying, shut up, you're going on too long. And I'm not broadcast, but I can wind. It doesn't work, but it is an option that is available to me. Um, and I think cause Skype's been around so long and it's a bit like the interface is quite clunky. It doesn't look as flashy. I think it gets a bit of a bad reputation in that Zoom's the new flashy, version and Skype gets a bit of a bad rap because it's the old uh, no one uses Skype anymore but for doing stuff like we're doing it's far and away better than Zoom. Zoom's very good at doing this but for what we're doing it just it just doesn't really work so I run the show as a vision mixer in the background with just I don't use the uh like the stream deck that Jamie's got because because I'm not on air I can just do everything with a keyboard and a trackpad I don't need to have quick shortcuts but if you are on air then Stream Deck's great because you can just shortcut everything up. And then you can just pump it out through, we use our own bit of software or OBS. You can go to something like Restream, which is free, I think, to two platforms. So you can be on YouTube and Twitch and Vimeo and all sorts of places all at the same time. So you can be just streaming to as many places you need to, which increases audience and whatnot, keeps your live chats running. The other question we get asked a lot is why don't we just pre-record it 
uh, because it would be obviously be better quality. We can edit it like a film. And our answer to that is always what would be the point. That's basically what YouTube was before there was a lockdown. You can make a film, you can stick it up. It looks great. Who cares? I mean, obviously people care. There's good YouTube videos, but you know what I mean? For the point of doing it during lockdown was we wanted it to be live. We wanted there to be a community. We interact with the live chat people. We get live when we do science shows, we do live science Q and A. So people are sending in questions and responding to stuff. If one of the scientists doesn't know an answer, which occasionally happens, we'll have someone in the chat that might know something. And if it's live, you just, you, you need to accept that things are going to go wrong and not really worry about it. People are going to have different crappy broadband qualities. Sometimes things are going to drop out and that's fine. That makes it more human. It makes it, it makes it part of the experience. And that's why, apart from the stuff we do, we're now producing some stuff for other societies and other podcasts who basically go, we just want our performers and speakers to be able to do it and not worry about how they're going to do it. So we did last night, it was a technical disaster if you watched it, but last night we did the off menu podcast live. James Acaster has Virgin Media, which doesn't work at the moment, but all he essentially had to do was do the podcast and we can handle everything in the back end and stream that out. And then the third thing we get, which is kind of relevant to this as well, is we don't do any screen sharing stuff. We can do it. Uh, Zoom is very good at doing it. But we feel like with our live shows, if you've got someone on stage and they're talking to the audience and they've got their PowerPoints behind them, it's still a, a three-dimensional experience. There's a person moving and there's a screen. When you do that online, you're just watching a PowerPoint presentation in a meeting and who cares? We've got people, Helen Chersky, I'm making draw graphs out and hold them up to screens. Uh, anyone that's got stills, print them out and hold. As proof of that, I can show you a picture in here that I got. So this is a uh, example of our, cause I'm not putting it on screen. Oh, see, this is the fun of live. I should have had this prepared earlier and I don't. Talk amongst yourselves, it's here somewhere. Maybe it isn't, there it is. So that's our part of our little home setup is that we've got, I can't see myself at the moment, two screens running where we've got the, oop, down there. We've got a Skype call, we've got a green room and we've got a mixing software so we can see what's happening, what's going out live. It does break your brain a little bit because you've got four, the show's happening in four different time speeds. So Skype is going at one, the mixing software is five seconds delayed then YouTube is about 30 seconds delayed. Twitch is at about 10 seconds delayed. Vimeo is. So I only listen to the Skype call because then I can mix it live essentially and catch up with things. So the YouTube chat is always behind. So that takes a bit of getting used to, but it's just an easier way to do it. Um, and yeah, it's, I, my main advice would be if you've got the option to have a mixer, a producer, a person, use them, get them to do it. Don't make your speakers mix themselves and have to worry about everything else at the same time. And just accept that it's gonna go wrong. No one wants to be doing this. It's all complete. We're doing a show on next Sunday night. We're meant to be live at the Albert Hall, uh, which we're obviously not. We're gonna do the same three hour show with 37 guests live online in about eight different countries it's going to break it's going to be absolute chaos but that's kind of part of the marketing of it now it's going to go weird that's what we're going to do and yeah that that's kind of everything from me i guess try and try and get someone to run your back end if you can accept everything's going to go wrong and celebrate that it's going to go wrong okay thanks right so uh, let's let's all have our little reactions so we get some Get some claps going there. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Yeah, that, 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 that's excellent. That's, it's, it's great to see um, sort of a, a contrast in approach there. That's all, a, a totally different way of doing it. Um, so we, we come to our third and final speaker, uh, Kat Lamin, who was a, a primary school teacher and uh, in 2016 became an educational consultant in computing science. 
So uh, I, I see from her uh, website that uh, she knows all about those fun things, raspberry pies and micro bits. And, so that's good. Um, she's certified as an educator by uh, Google and Apple. And uh, she's also she's a, uh, sorry, a Google certified innovator and trainer and has been running virtual maths lessons for her tutoring students since lockdown began. And uh, she's also been running uh, mental health chat. Oops, somebody's out again. In the background. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll, I'll start that sentence again. She's also been running mental health chats for teachers through Google Meet. So anyway, take it away, Kat. A small amount of imposter syndrome kicking in right now after everyone else has spoke, uh, spoken because I'm, I'm just a teacher. <laughs> so this is slightly different angle on everything. Um, I, as was mentioned, I'm a G Suite user. Uh, so I'm going to be, I'm sorry, you, you have got my other half in the background. He's on a work meeting. So I hope he's not too disruptive. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a teacher uh, by profession, but actually now what I do more often is train teachers, uh, mostly in G Suite. Uh, so lots and lots of work with Google Meet. Um, and I thought I would actually just do a little bit of clarification about Google, because I know people have heard of Google Classroom, Google Meet, don't really know what's going on there, but it's sort of the ecosystem. It's all around the ecosystem, G Suite for Education. Um, I'm very aware I've got a lot of white space. Um, so G Suite for Education, includes all these different bits of software um, which is docs, sheets, forms, sites, um, loads of really cool things like that and obviously Meet which is the video sharing platform and I use that for most of my interactions um, because what I'm doing is a lot of maths work I use Meet integrated with something called Jamboard uh, which I'm going to share with you in just a moment. I'm just building up to it because I have to switch devices because now I'm feeling really like I shouldn't share my device after Trent said that. So I'm like, oh. but um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to basically talk you through a few tools that I use for teaching maths because it's a completely different perspective to the other guys, but hey ho. Um, and yeah, talk about how I do online teaching because that's what I now do. Lots of online maths, lots of online other stuff. In fact, next week, I'm going to be doing a primary primary maths webinar. So if anyone's got any suggestions for cool and interesting ways to teach maths online, I would love to hear what you are suggesting, because I think sometimes if we're just delivering content, it gets a bit boring. So I want to try and think of really exciting ways to make maths exciting, um, repeating myself a lot. So let me just share my other device because that's how I do things nowadays, because I'm really cool like that. Um, there we go. So hopefully you can see this one. Um, I'm afraid it's decided to reopen things that I'd already closed. So um, the first thing I'm going to show you is Google Docs, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It looks like Word. Um, and I'm really lucky that I use an extension called Equatio. Um, and hopefully some of you will quite like this. Uh, if I click on the pencil icon, I've got a little stylus for this particular device because it's touch screen. Ooh. My um, my Chrome, my Chromebook's decided to have a little hissy fit with me. You'll notice it's turning it rather helpfully into a mathematical equation on the right there. Because I know I'm really repeating myself as well. Um, I'm obviously nervous about talking in front of all of these famous people. Um, so what Equation does is very very simply allows you to. Um, create maths that you can insert easily. Now, rather annoyingly, Chrome OS is throwing a little hissy fit at me. Um, there we go. So it inserts the maths as an image, which can then be copied and pasted. Oh, that's going really well. There we go. So basically, what I, whatever I typed in, it decided to turn it into that as an image. So I can copy and paste that into other documents. So it's really nice if you're doing a maths worksheet for students. Um, you can also draw a graph very easily. In fact, it's just graphed the last bit of information I've done. You can type it in, uh, type in your formula. It's a very different way to what everyone else is doing. I'm sorry, it's slightly more interesting. It's also got symbols. It's got some pre-written equations. Sorry, I keep bringing up my touch bar at the bottom, which is rather irritating. Um, let's look up the quadratic. Oh, it helps if I can spell. I meant to do it in that one. And it will just drop that one in for you. Um, and the nice thing about G Suite is you've got something called forms. Um, and forms that you do quizzes. And quizzes can be self-marking. 
So if I click up here, I've got quizzes and I can make this a quiz that's self-marking. Um, you can see basic maths question here. Um, and I've got an answer key, so I know what the correct answer is. It's 27. Um, if my student looks at it, they just see it like this. But I've also used that equatio again um, to create this document down here, factorise fully. Um, the pupils just select the right answer. You can see I've input those images uh, really easily with the text. So it's just a case of using the equatio icon on the side. Um, so this is a quiz I can assign my students. They can work it out and mark it themselves. Uh, and that's where Google Classroom comes into it. So Google Classroom, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Be prepared for everything to go horribly wrong because it broke. Oh, no, it didn't break everything this time. Um, so Google Classroom is another tool that G Suite make, but it's a classroom management tool. So it's all about sharing with a group of students. It's like Facebook for kids. And that's what I use it for more than anything when I'm teaching a whole class. Uh, so you've got this sort of environment with G Suite where you've got loads and loads of different things you can do. Um, but it's all under one sign in. And the nice thing is it's completely free for schools. So you don't have to worry about the accounts. They're much more protected because you've created the accounts. Everything they're doing is loosely monitored, stored in Google Vault, um, which is only accessible by admins. So if they are using email, there's transcripts of it, there's all that kind of stuff. So as a teacher, it's much, much safer. Um, yeah, Mathagon is another really great tool. So I've just seen that pop up in the chat. Um, I'm talking really quickly, I'm sorry. I do that sometimes when I'm nervous. The other thing about Equatio is that um, I spoke to them yesterday and they said anybody in this call is welcome to have a completely free version, free copy of it. So it's a, an extension that goes onto Google Chrome. You just need a Gmail account to log into it. Um, if I drop that link in the chat, basically Patrick said, if you can give him your name, email address, institution or company, he will set you up with a free account for Equatio. So if you want to use it, you are welcome to, um, which is very kind of him. Um, yeah, so I said most of my stuff is done through Google Meet. Uh, Google Meet is slightly more simple than Zoom um, in the sense that it, it was a very new product. They were using Hangouts as a very simple video tool they started to build Meet as a business tool and then suddenly this happened. Um, and so they've been rapidly, rapidly changing it to suit education. Uh, so originally you couldn't see multiple participants at a time. You could only see one. Uh, you could only see one if there were more than four people in the chat. Uh, now you can see 16. Um, you, uh, you, anyone could join a Meet if they had the link. Now they've made it so that only students can join a meet if the teachers created the meet and things like that. It's, it's sort of on really rapid upgrade. Um, so I've just seen a question. Can you use Google Meet with students at other schools if the schools allowed it? Uh, it's all, Google's all managed at a school level. So if pupils have a student account, it's up to the school to decide whether or not they can um, use products outside of the school, outside of the school domain. It's very, very easy to micromanage accounts. Um, I am a Google trainer, which means I have my own training domain. So I can basically create accounts for my students on G Suite that act like education accounts and I can operate them, manage them. Um, to become a Google trainer, you have to do two online tests and then submit a video demonstrating how you train. Um, and I've got a speaker in the background that's talking. Sorry, there we go. Oh God, gotta love it. <laughs> um, and Oh, what I didn't mention, sorry, was because I was so distracted. Uh, so one of the G Suite tools is something called Jamboard. And again, it's another tool that was made for, edge, for business first because they basically want to sell movable interactive whiteboards that you move around the office. Um, and they are collaborative um, whiteboards. And the nice thing is that you don't need a Chromebook to use Jamboard. So you don't need a, a Jamboard to use Jamboard because Jamboard is, a, is hardware and software. The software is free. If you've got a touchscreen device, you can use Jamboard natively in browser. So you can just draw on the screen. Um, it's a fantastic tool and it's all integrated. Um, so what I do in my math lessons generally, although I've got Equatio, what I do is I'll have a meet running and then I'll also have my Jamboard down. My students have their mobile phone with the Jamboard on and they can follow along with what I'm doing or they can scribble on or whatever they want. And if they're lucky to have an iPad, even better, they've got a second device they can scribble on. Um, and it means that then 
I've got two workspaces because I can keep eye contact, but I've also got something I can scribble on down here that the students can see. Um, and uh, that was sort of my whistle stop tour of G Suite for Education. Sorry, I definitely lost the thread a bit there and burbled. So um, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Oh no! Well, th thanks, for, thanks for that excellent little uh, talk there. Um, sure, everybody can give their claps and thumbs up um, to show their appreciation. <laughs> right there. You might want to have a look at the uh, responses to the, the bit at the start where it's, it says uh, "just a teacher." Um, so, like, yeah, every, <laughs> everybody's sending their support. <laughs> so, um, anyway, Thank that was you. great um, from all three speakers. Uh, we had a, a lots of different perspectives there, so that was that was fantastic. So what I'm going to do now is going to hand over to Ben, who's going to run the question and answer session for us. So please, Ben.